Good morning, class. Now we will be talking about the sponges. Sponges are very bizarre, very unusual animals. As a matter of fact, some scientists have debates about how much of an animal they actually are at all. And if you remember the taxonomy video quiz that you did on Tuesday, that I, that I dropped on Tuesday, if those of you have looked at it, they mentioned how a lot of different animal groups have similarities, but the outlier is the sponges. And we're going to talk today about why they're such outliers. So if we look at topics we're covering, we're going to be covering sponges, starting off as how they represent the rise of multicellular animals. We'll talk about their ancestry and when they first arose. We'll talk about some general features of the phylum and also talk about the three classes of peripherins. We'll go briefly into taxonomy and ecology and form and function, and including sponge feeding. We'll talk about their water vascular system, the canal system, which is unique to, to uh, sponges. And then we'll talk about sponge cell types, reproduction, and, and again, finish off for the last classes. Okay, one of the big deals about sponges is that this is really the first instance where we see in present day life forms the origin of multicellularity. And we talked about multi unicellular eukaryotes in Wednesday's lecture. This is the first grouping we'll be talking about where we actually have multicellular life forms where cells cluster together, differentiate into different functions and types and form an actual animal. So there's a lot of different times that multicellularity has shown up in the history of life, but the one that really stands out that we'll be talking about the rest of the semester are the metazoans, the multicelled animals. Okay, if we look back in early uh, Cambrian times, the ancestor to sponges and thus to all other animals, was probably a coanoflagellate. Now you remember we were talking about protozoans and other eukaryotes? A coanoflagellate looks pretty much like this. It's basically a grape-shaped organism that has two unique features besides the nucleus, of course. It has a flagella, very similar to the flagella you would see in like a euglena, but it also has something called a collar. And what this collar is, is a series of, a, um, of microfibrils that form a, a tube-shaped net that sits at the base of the flagella. And what happens is as the flagella wiggles back and forth, it pulls water through the net and allows the coanoflagellate to capture food particles. Now, this is a very adaptive uh, feature for a coanoflagellate it allowed it to be much more uh, careful, much more uh, efficient about grabbing food particles, but it soon le led to another great innovation as well. And that's the whole idea of colonial co coanoflagellates. Now, uh, you saw there was a single coanoflagellate when they first evolved, they basically floated around living as single cell organisms in the water column but very quickly, they found a great advantage to forming a cluster, a colony. And that's because you had a multiple of those, of those flagellates flipping back and forth and pulling more water through the animal's uh, collar cells than they would have done as individuals. So that means that there was a big advantage to having that kind of arrangement. And pretty soon, a whole group of animals evolved to really maximize that. So the earliest colonial co coanoflagellates looked like this. They probably had five or six individuals. And then pretty soon, they started to look like this Feroica colony. It's a present-day colony that usually has 30 to 100 uh, separate coanoflagellates clustered in like a ball floating around in the water column. So the coanoflagellates were the sister group to all other animals, all the way up to humans. And we'll see that when we look at the roadmap, but basically this is a sister group 
or the ancestor for all the other animals on, on Earth. And what that means is that some of the similarities that we first see here began to be communicated forward in limited form for a lot of the other phyla. The way we're looking at them now is to show their similarity to sponges. Okay, it's a very clear transition to a sponge. You had a coenoflagellate existing as a single individual organism or as a, a loose association or a colony. And then you can look at that structure and see the inside of a coeno, the inside of a sponge, and there they have these specialized cells that are called coenocytes. And they have an almost identical structure to that of a um, of an actual coenoflagellate. So it shows a very clear relationship and ancestry. So sponges differentiated amongst other life forms somewhere in the early Cambrian period, probably between 540 and 520 million years ago. They took these vase-shaped forms with a central space. And what happened is that they were evolved to be almost like a highly evolved coenoflagellate colony. They basically had the inside of the central space lined with coenocytes, and they had these pores in here that, are, that allow for water to pass into the central space and pass past the actual collar cells and uh, allow the collars to actually um, strain, out, um, strain out food particles. Now, if you look at the body, it has an endoskeleton that's made out of spicules, which are sort of like calcareous uh, crystalline structures that are actually embedded in the structure of the sponge and will give it greater support. Okay, there's some general features of uh, the phylum periphera. Periphera comes from a Greek word that means poor or poor or hole bearing. Um, sponges tend to be sessile. They're filter feeders, and their body, of course, is perforated by many pores and or canals. They have skeletons made of spicules and, and or collagen. Collagen is sort of a fibrous protein-derived uh, compound. Marine sponges are found in all seas, at all depths. You can actually find them in the waters off of uh, Boston and off of Cape Cod. Many of these species are brightly colored because of the pigments that exist in their dermal cells. And some appear to be radially symmetrical, as we'll see in starfish, but most of them are asymmetrical. Remember when I was saying that in these non bilateral animals, they're weakly symmetrical or they have no symmetry whatsoever. And most periphery don't have any symmetry and they're rather regular in shape. Some of them can stand erect, some can be branches, some can grow as a crust on the surface. Let's look at some of these growth forms of sponges. This is an encrusting sponge over here. This encrusting sponge grows on the side of a coral head. This is a red boring sponge. Red boring sponges are actually sponges that actually bore into the surface of corals and basically monopolize the external space that allows it for greater efficiency of filtration of particle food particles. This is a finger sponge over here. This is called a variable sponge. It basically means it's a variable shape, and this is a tube sponge. Okay, if you look at the classes of the phylum periphera, as I said, the fossil record goes back to the early Cambrian, and we normally put living sponges into three different classes, calcarea, Hexactinellida and Demospongidae. Now, if we look at calcarea, calcarean sponges usually have calcium carbonate spicules. Calcium carbonate meaning a calcium compound that's similar to what you find in shells. Hexactinellids have spicules that are made out of silicon silica crystals, so they basically have glass spicules, and you will see this with their delicate and unique shape. And finally, the members of the Demospongiae have solifus spicules or spongin fibers of both. Spongin is a type of specialized protein. It means that Demospongiae 
tend to have bodies that are less rigid because of the protein fibers, the luxal protein fibers in them. It's the fourth class that we won't really talk about, Homo scleromorpha. It used to be a subgroup of the Themospongiae. But we're not really going to talk about them. Okay, if we look at this grouping over here, you can basically see the Demospongiae and the Axonellids axon are more closely related to each other than they are to the Calcispongiae. If you look at their ecological relationships and some of the, the actual distribution of these animals, there's probably about 5,000 species of sponges that are almost primarily marine. There's only about 150 species that are found in fresh water. The growth patterns really are driven by the shape of the substrate they're growing on, the direction, the speed of the water current, and the available space. Many animals live as commensals. Now, when we talk about commensal, as you remember, that means one animal gets a benefit from the, from the presence of the other animal, while for the other animal, it's a neutral presence. So many animals live as commensals and sponges, where they get the benefit of hiding within a sponge and it doesn't affect the sponge at all. Although there are some of them that are parasites as well. So sponges grow on a variety of other living organisms, especially slow moving ones or sessile ones like barnacles and coral and moss. There are probably few uh, animals that predate on predator, that predate on sponges because their elaborate skeletal structure prevents them from being easily eaten or nibbled on. And they often throw off chemical substances that repel predators. Okay, if we look at the form here, we can see that it has a, a double layered uh, body structure with a number of pores in them. These pores are called ostia. The ostia represents the pores allow the water to come into the central area, the central chamber. The hole on the top of the central chamber is called the osculum. And it's basically what we call the excurrent hole. It's what actually allows the water to exit the animal. The central cavity is also called a sponge seal, which basically means sponge room. And you'll see here, we'll blow that up so you can see it more easily. This little vase-shaped uh, structure is a coanocyte. It's a cell that has this, the approximate physical structure of a coanoflagellate. And behind it is an amoebocyte, which is a cell that looks a little bit like an amoeba. So here we see differentiation of different cells in the different forms for different functions. So in the case of the coanocyte, as we'll see, it's basically used to, to pick up food particles and to pass the nutritive value of the food particles, the amoebocytes. Now, if we look inside carefully, we can see there's a series between the two layers, the inner layer of coanocytes and the outer layer of these shell-like, um, these plate-like uh, cells. This material here that's called mesohyl or mesenchyme, it's sort of a gelatinous material that exists between the inner and outer layer of the sponges. And it helps to perform, helps to serve as a structural. And it's what the actual spicules, which you'll see as these little tiny um, triangular shapes, exist in. So if we look at sponge ride, hmm. I'd like to show this video. Let's do this. Let's hold off the video and I'll show it in class next week. It is a very interesting video. But that video will show how efficiently sponges can actually filter food out of the uh, environment. Okay, sponges have three different types of canal systems. They have ascanoid, cyconoid, and leuconoid. And what you see from you, when you go from the ascanoid to the cyconoid to the leuconoid is a higher degree of complexity as you go from one sponge type to another. So here the ascanoid just basically acts as a straight tube that's lined with the coanocytes. So the water just comes in through the side of the organism, just pumps up through the middle and allows it to filter 
filter organisms out by passing it past the coenocytes in sort of a unidirectional flow. If you look at psychonoid, here we have these evaginations. You look at the body of the wall, instead of being like a two, uh, two simple wall structures with the coenocytes on the inside, it's actually a series of evaginations. So you have fingers sticking outside. Each finger is, is a separate chamber that's lined with the coenocytes. And water gets pulled in through these specialized um, ostia that are called prosopiles. And what happens is it pulls the water in to what is now a radial canal. It gets pushed past the um, coenocytes and it has a much higher filtration efficiency. So it has the ability to pull more food particles out of the water. Finally, when you look at the leuconoid structure, you can see something that's even more highly evolved where the coenocytes are wrapped around this, these central chambers over here. Water gets pulled in through these canals past the simple chamber and it has, the water has to take a torturous route to get to the uh, ostium. And that torturous route gives the sponge organism time to take more food particles out of the water. Okay, we'll start off with asconoids with the flagellated spongiceles. They have the simplest body form with a large body cavity called the spongiceal. As I said, the quinoflagellate flagella pull the water through the, uh, through the ostia and expel it through the osculum on the top. All the asconoid sponges that we see are in the class calcarea, which means that this is probably the class that's closely related to the ancestral form of sponges. Then there are psychonoids. They resemble astraconids, but they have a more a thicker body wall. And as I said, it, it's evaginated so that you have these separate chambers that are called radial canals that allow for a greater efficiency of food particle removal. Okay, so finally we have leuconoids. They basically have a, a, a complex net of flagellated chambers that are hooked up eventually to the sponge seal and allow water to take this torturous route so that the organism can most efficiently pull food particles out of the water stream. Now this leuconoid system evolved independently many times in sponges, but it's found in some of the larger, more developed sponges. Okay, so if you look at the different types of cells that sponges uh, have, you can see they fall into several simple categories. I talked a little bit about the uh, coanocytes, which are the feeding cells. But if you look at the animals, it's consistent, it consists of these external plates. These plates are made out of cells that are called panacocytes, and they basically form a sort of a armored plate covering. Then there are amoebocytes that actually move back and forth in the cell body between the inner and the outer layer. And these amoebocytes can have many functions. They can be defense functions for chasing down um, alien particles. They can carry food, um, food and nutrients around, and they can also, in their modified form, grow these spicules. These spicules are those crystalline structures I talk about that have unique shapes and chemical compositions as we move from one species of sponge to the next. Okay, we can sort of see this over here. This is, uh, these are types of uh, amoebocytes. There's an archaeocyte and a colenocyte, but those are just basically different types of amoebocytes that have different functions. There's the pinacocyte that helps to form the actual plate structure. And of course, these are the coenocyte. Notice that the, there's an inner layer that has the coenocytes in it and an outer layer that has the um, pinacocytes in it. And of course, these structures are the spicules over here. But in between the two, two layers, there's a gelatinous material called the mesohyle. And we'll see this in a number of less evolved animals or more early evolved animals that they have an external gelatinous material. We used to call it extracellular material. And in this case, it's called a mesohyle. And it basically helps to, uh, to uh, form a medium for which the other cells can pass through.
Okay, archaeocytes are amoeboid cells, as I said. They move around in the mesohyl, and they tend to act as a defensive function. They can actually chew up uh, alien particles that are invading, like a disease particle. They can actually eat it, it's sort of similar to the way a white blood cell does in our body. But then they also have different functions as well. They can evolve into function. They can evolve into cells that produce spicules, sclerocytes. They can be spongicytes and produce spongin, that that structural protein substance. And cholinocytes produce fibrous collagen, which is another structural compound that's used to form the body of the sponge. The macrocytes are those flat epithelial cells. Porocytes actually form the tubes, the ostea, that allow, that allow water to pass into the uh, body of the sponge. So you act like a through tube over here. So you have the choanoderm surface with all the choanocytes in it. You have the panacoderm surface on the outside with the panacocytes on it. And then you have the, um, the porocyte that's formed by these cells that actually penetrates the two layers and there's a passage for water to pass through. Okay, when we have filter feeding, as I said, the current is generated by the, by the rotating the flapping of the flagella. And what that does is it creates a, a current that pulls water through the ostea, past the coanocytes, past their collar structures so that they can actually pick up food particles and then finally up the up through the top of the animal through the osculum. If you look carefully at this structure here, you can see that the water flow passes like this. Water flow passes like this through the collar cell, then up through the inside, and then out. And what happens is this process will take food particles, let's make them dark red, like that one. That one, or that one, and move them down to the base where the uh, coanocyte can absorb the food particle. Okay, so like I said, they, these coanocytes line the flagellated canals and the chambers and the inside of the sponges sealed in the simple, uh, simple sponges. And they basically form a fine filtering device to strain food. Very efficient. Okay, if we look at the type of skeletons, these are really typified by the different types of the skeletal elements. They're both fibrous skeletal elements and rigid skeletal elements. So the fibrous ones are usually associated with a collagen that's inside of the extracellular matrix, the mesohyl. Sometimes they actually they uh, secrete spongin, which is a specialized protein for this structural purpose. But it's basically fibers that are exuded into the mesohyl and help to form the physical structure of the wall of the sponge. The other thing that forms it and forms a somewhat defensive process because it really stiffens and makes it harder to break through are these rigid structures that are called spicules. And spicules have different shapes. The shapes are unique, as you can see here, for the individual species. And in addition, the material that they're made of differs from one class of sponge to the other. So for instance, like the calcarea uh, class of sponges has calcareous carbonate spicules. And the hexactinellids have spicules that are made out of silica. So they're sort of like sculptured glass. So they can be quite um, unusual in shape and really indicative of the species. So you can see the different uh, spicule types here. These are calcareous spicules over here. These are siliceous spicules. These are found on hexactinellids. Then you have siliceous spicules that are found in demospongiae along with the spongin fibers here. So each of these are associated with different classes of sponges. And the shape, of course, is indicative of different species of sponges as well. So sponges consume detritus, plankton, and bacteria, whatever's found in the water column that's edible. 
There's no real respiratory or excretory system, just diffusion of the animals into the environment and from the environment serve that purpose. If you think about it, they're very, there's not much to their physical form. The insides are full of water. Their body wall is only about two layers of, um, two or three layers of cells thick, and they have water passing through their body water in a lot of, and through their body wall in a lot of places. So it's very easy for them to pick up um, metabolites and expel um, waste products just by sheer diffusion. So if you look at large sponges, they can move about 1,500 liters of water per day. Some sponges have the ability to move very slowly. The ones that move the fastest can crawl up to four millimeters per day. Boy, that's fast. Okay, most sponges are monoesis, monoesis, which means that they have male and female sex cells in one individual. The sperm arise from transformed coenocytes. The oocytes, or the egg cells, develop from coenocytes or archaeocytes. And usually what happens is that the sperm released by one individual will enter the canal system of another individual and allow for fertilization in that route. We'll talk about other forms of um, reproduction in sponges, but let's talk about development first. So the free swimming larvae sponges, this is a solid parenchy parenchymula. The parenchymula will settle on the surface, and once it settles on the surface, then it starts to um, metamorphose into a different shape, and it goes from being a solid parenchymula into having the flagellated cells that, are list, that exist on the outside of the larvae migrate to the inwards side of the larvae and form the flagellate chamber that's associated with adult sponges. It looks like this. Here's the parenchymula larva. It's floating around in the water column. You can see the coenocytes are sticking out of on the outside of its body. Then it lands on the surface. The spicules start to rearrange themselves. It starts to develop a, um, a sponge seal. And as it's doing that, the coenocytes that are on the outside move to the inside. And as they move to the inside, they start to form their uh, chamber systems so that the juvenile sponge can start to pull water in like a real uh, adult sponge. Okay, there's also a strong amount of asexual reproduction in sponges. They have a great ability to regenerate lost parts and repair injuries. They can reproduce um, asexual just by having pieces break off get carried by the environment to land in another place and then reestablish itself to form a, a new colony of sponges. Usually what happens is that there are internal buds that are called gemmules that can break off and these actually can exist in harsh environments like drought and freezing and lack of oxygen and live to form new sponges. One of the interesting things about sponges, there's a gemmule right there, one of the interesting things about sponges is they have a huge ability to regenerate their form. And it's something out of a science fiction movie. A scientist did one of the famous experiments where he took a living sponge, ground it up with a mortar and pestle, took the mortar and pestle, took the, uh, the sponge goo that he generated by grinding it up, passed it through a sieve so the particles were finely divided and totally separated and put it into a jar full of salt water. And within two days, the sponge had gathered all its cells together and reconstituted itself as a living sponge. Just imagine us being passed through a sieve and then having the ability to take all of our macerated cells and regenerate our form as a human. That would be a neat trick. Okay, let's talk about some of those classes. Calcarea sponges have the spicules of calcium carbonate. This is the class calcarea also known as the calci spongiae. The spicules tend to be pretty straight and have maybe three or four rays. And most of them tend to be small sponges with tubular or vast shapes. And they can have different types of uh, body forms. They can be an asconoid, psychonoid, or leuconoid. And a good example of them are the leucosalenia and the psychon. Those are common examples. And we'll see some of these around here.
Then there's the Hexactinellidae, those are also called Ayala spongiae, and these animals are really quite beautiful and quite striking. They actually are glass sponges. The spicules have six rays, the way a snowflake will have six different arms. They're nearly all living in the deep sea form. They tend to be radially symmetrical, and their tissue structure is quite different from other sponges. They have a trabecular reticulum, which is a continuous syncytial tissue. It's the largest that's known among animals. And it's layered with coanoblasts and other cells between these different layers. And if you look here, these are, represent what they look like. So what happens is they look as if they were these very sort of fanciful, diaphanous, highly structured glass structures that the organisms actually have their tissues embedded inside of the glass, glass uh, skeletons. So what happens is that the collar bodies, the collar cells, line the chambers between the two layers of this reticulum and collect food. So we look at it, we can take a, a hexactinellid uh, sponge and we can carve a hole in its a section out of its wall and you can actually see it has a really highly organized structure. So here's the outer wall here. Here we have ostium pulling in water here. It goes into this highly developed network of um, glass structures. It's pulled into these holes here, the posa pile. Each one of these chambers that look like little spaceships align with these coanoblasts, which are basically coanos modified coana cells that allow it to actually collect um, food particles from inside the chamber. So these animals are very highly efficient filtration systems. Okay, there's a demo spongiae which basically represents most of the living sponge species we see today. The skeleton is made out of siliceous spicules or spongin. It has a leuconoid body form. And all of these, except for one order of uh, freshwater sponges, sorry, one class of freshwater sponges, are found in marine systems. Now the freshwater sponges that we see are widely distributed in well oxygenated ponds and springs. So if you actually were to go into some of the ponds and springs around, ponds around here in Worcester County, you would probably see freshwater sponges there. They live in the summertime, they die in late autumn, leave behind gemerules, which then reproduce and become new sponges the next year. Family of those, the uh, class of those that, um, that are represented in Demo spongiae, if you've ever had a, a bath with a bath sponge, Bath sponges are in this class. And the way they make bath sponges when they're not made out of plastic like they are for cheap ones is they take a real sponge, boil it to get rid of all the tissue, and what's left over are the spongin, spongin skeleton that existed that produced, that formed the body of the sponge. That's why a sponge is called a sponge in the first place. Okay, here's a, we're going to show you a couple of the different uh, sponges here. This is Pseudoceratina. One of the things about sponges now is when you find them in colonies, they can actually form, they can actually add to physical structure in a lot of these marine environments and therefore form an important ecological role in providing diverse structure in these bottom, for these bottom communities. You can see there's a wide range of them where they have animals and different organisms, they have different organisms living on them. Like to me, that looks like an organism there. I can't see quite what it is. It could be a shrimp, but I'll have to blow it up. Here's another case of a, uh, of a sponge. It has a very fanciful form. A lot of times these sponges will have pigments associated with their bodies that are photosynthetic uh, cells that have been sort of incorporated into them and help to provide additional nutrients to them. Okay, so there's the last class is the Homo scleromorpha. As I said, it's not a class that's really as important. Um, the marine sponges that are found in the range of colors, um, they tend to live in cryptic habitats and they may or may not have spicules. So, 
In conclusion, sponges appeared before the Cambrian, they were a very early form of animal life. Glass sponges appeared around the um, Devonian period. Sponges are the sister group to all animophila, which means that sponges have an ancestor that's the common ancestor. So sponges on one side and all the other animals that exist today on the other. So despite their simple body plan, sponges have features that are associated with other animal phyta as well. They have proteins for cell adhesion and cell signaling that are homologous, that are similar to those of other metazoans. And they, their development includes a blastula stage. And as we saw in the development of all animals, all animals have a blastula stage as well. And some sponges may even have a two-layered gastrula stage. Okay, so in conclusion, periphrines are a highly successful group. Their diversification is really centered on their unique ability to um, filter food particles out of the water and their degree of complexity that they use to really maximize what they can do with their water current system. There's a new feeding mode that's evolved in the family of sponges found in deep water caves where the hook-like spicules evolve and cover the most of its body, and then the spicule layer entangles crustaceans, and then the filaments of the sponge body grow over the prey. So in this case, in this really unusual case, they are carnivores, not suspension feeders. And because of that, they don't have coanocytes or internal, um, internal canals. All right, I'm going to stop there for now. It's really great um, having a chance to talk to you about sponges. And I will see you in class on Monday. Please don't forget to do the quiz today.